So we've got Todd on the line. What do you want to ask him? Is there a recommendation for the most effective way you found in the beginning to find deals? Would that be brokers, wholesalers, any advice? Definitely do not. And me being in real estate for a long time, I'm like, oh, I'll just talk to the big dogs or whatever. Now, the experienced brokers they already have, they can make a phone call and probably sell whatever listing they have to 10 or 20 people without ever putting it on the market easily. So you getting in with them, just forget it. Just mm -hmm. go with the younger brokers, yeah. even maybe, you know, not the big houses, maybe even like a Keller Williams commercial mm -hmm. or whatever. Just connect with these younger, more hungry agents that aren't well-established. The brokers that are well-established, it's not worth your time. I'm Brian Briscoe, host of the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. And this podcast is different than everything else out there. I bring together a new and an experienced investor on each episode, and I let the aspiring investor ask the questions that they need answered. So if you're an aspiring investor yourself, you probably will have the exact same questions. Now, before we get to this episode, make sure you hit the subscribe button below and that little bell to make sure you get notified every time we post a new episode. And now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Diary and Apartment Investor Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe. Very excited for today's show. It's another one of our Ask the Expert episodes. And we have two great people on the line with us today. We've got Todd Schoengert and Caitlin Aquaviva. And... First of all, welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Awesome. Great to have you guys. And as, as most people who listen know, we're going to bring our experienced investor up first. So, Todd, welcome. Thank you for letting you know. It's an honor to be here, Brian. I appreciate it. Thank you. And it was great meeting you in Orlando a little bit ago. I very much enjoyed our conversation there. But do us a favor or do the listeners a favor and tell them a little bit about you. Oh, well, let's see. I can stick with the uh, how in investing in real estate started. Mm -hmm. And that started when I was 14 with my grandpa, Sean Gertz. My nice. dad, dad sent me a book on a uh, whole laid out strategy on investing in single family detached houses. And so from 14 years on, investing in real estate always made sense to me. I don't mm -hmm. know if my dad ever read the book, but I, I did. And it stuck with me. Long story short, you know, started as like a commercial broker, mm -hmm. realized early on that, you know, it really is helpful to have some money to be able to buy stuff. Yep. And then at some point I realized that I had some unique skills on finding good deals in a good market and other people either didn't want to take the time to get those same skills or actually couldn't do it. I thought everybody could do it just because I could do it. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. When I my mind opened to other people's money, then that just amplified you know, my investments that I could take, could mm -hmm. make, you know, so if I could do joint ventures and other things because I could find the deals, manage the deals, do all that stuff. And they had dry powder, you know, money on the sidelines waiting to do something with it. And they trusted me. So, yeah. so there are these lessons you learn along the way. And now I'm, uh, what? 50, so I'm 40 years past that 14 year old book reading. So <laughs> yeah, we, won't, we won't say 50 anything. 40 That's years right. past 14 <laughs> sounds a lot yeah. better. My dad would say, yeah, 14 years old with 40 years experience. That's how he'd say it. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Makes sense. Well, cool. So yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, go, go along the same path, you know, brokerage, real estate into, you know, exactly what we're doing. What were some of the challenges you had getting started in multifamily? So early on, I figured out that mindset was a really big deal. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're going to be being your own, you're being your own boss or doing whatever. You know, you get plenty of rope to hang your enough plenty enough rope to hang yourself as your own boss. Mm -hmm. And so, really diving into that, and then at some point, I came across Dave Lindahl and the RE Mentor outfit, yeah. and that was probably 20 years ago. And so things finally lined up in my life to where my son was older as a single dad and I was able to see a recession come and I'm like, okay, now it's go time. And that was probably three years ago that it's go time to really dive in, get a mentor and really get after the multifamily side of it. Because it was all, before that was residential investment, you know, maybe two plex or four plex and stuff, but never into the commercial, which was just a, just a bigger animal. And it's like, mm -hmm. um, you know, I knew how much time and attention just a single little residential thing is and how... If I want it done to my standards and how I want, even if it's my most trusted contractor, mm -hmm. and that, you know, I still feel like I have to be there almost every single day to make yeah. sure it's done how I want it done. And I'm thinking, they multiply that by like 200 units. I'm like, holy, you know, your brain starts to melt and it's real overwhelming. So, yeah. So, definitely the mentor was a huge help. And it was just uh, doing these bigger deals. It's you have to believe. That's what I was mm -hmm. originally going to answer it with. Yeah. You have to believe that you belong there, that mm -hmm. it's the logical next step for you. Because like the first multifamily deal I did was 30 units. Mm -hmm. The next one is 550 units. 
Mm-hmm. Now, that's a huge jump, but it just felt like to me, okay, that's the next logical step. Oh, we're not we're not going to just buy those two complexes. We're going to buy all five of them. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, all right, next logical step. Let's do it. Yeah. So you don't, you know, there's a, a younger me would have blocked that, would have got worried, would have, you know, mucked it up, vibe and and confidence wise and all that. But yeah. the older me is like, no, okay, that's how it's going to go. Go with the flow. I got it. Yeah. You know, and, and me getting started, I mean, if, if I'm honest with myself, I mean, a lot of people talk about the brokers and everything else. I probably waited on the sidelines for, you know, a dozen years or so with mindset issues, not believing that I could do it, you know, not mm-hmm. believing that I remember reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I've said this on the show a dozen times, at least I remember reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and he talks about multifamily and he talks about investing in multifamily. And I remember thinking, man, that's great for him. He's Robert Kiyosaki, but I can't do that. Exactly. You know? And I had that big mindset block and it wasn't, uh, it took me, you know, at least a dozen years to get to the point to where I had enough single family to realize that, you know what, I could probably do this apartment thing. It's it's not going to be a whole bunch more work than the single family properties that I have. But yeah, that was it for me too, was exactly that mindset. Big time. Big so. time. It's, it's, it's most of everything. So real quick, let's talk about your why, you know, why you're doing this. What would you call your big burning why? It's almost like a spiritual thing to where one part of it for sure is like, it's almost, it would be offensive Mm -hmm. to live in this country and not go after opportunities and not be afraid to be the man in the arena with the blood on his face and the sweat and everybody can judge him and all that. But the old, well, I think that was Teddy Roosevelt quote. It was, yeah, and I love that. That's yeah. a great, great quote. And but to you to have the cojones to do that and really live and take it, you know, you could travel around a little and see all, and your eyes open to all the opportunities we have mm-hmm. here. I mean, I was talking to my buddy Jim from Canada, and he's a very, very successful businessman and the, the real estate guy and all that. And mm-hmm. I'm like, you know, Jim, there's probably more opportunity just in texas than in than there is in all of canada he goes oh by far not even close there's so much more opportunity in texas than in our entire country Mm -hmm. Uh, just so to have stuff like that and then not do something with it you know how my personality is i'm not just me i'm not made to sit in a cubicle Mm -hmm. so if i live in this country you better get after it and do something plus there's the whole legacy thing with my son and all that and and helping the community and there's a whole bunch of different things going on so Mm -hmm. But that to me is like, uh, what are you doing? You know, what are you yeah. doing? You you live in the land of opportunity, and you're gonna what work in a cubicle and watch TV? I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah, take advantage of some of those opportunities. It actually wasn't until I lived overseas for the first time, and I, I probably spent a uh, sum total of about 10 years of my life, just under one quarter of my life overseas. But uh, it wasn't until my first time living overseas that. I realized that we really were in the land of opportunity, you know, seeing what, what other people have as far as opportunities. It was just like, yeah, same thing for me. It's like, let's not take this for granted. Hundred percent. My dad was a mailman. You know, I didn't grow up with, you know, I, I thought I was poor growing up. Right. But I just realized that, you know, a mailman's son has much more opportunity here than almost anybody anywhere else. So yeah, that's we've, we've that already, we've yeah. all, we all have already won the lottery by being born here. Yeah. So, yep, lottery tickets. You've got to go cash it in. So, yeah. well, cool. Well, let's talk about one of the properties you've done. So, you know, pick your first, your favorite, and tell us uh, tell us a little bit about it. Uh, well, the, I guess the first one is this 30 unit. And it's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, there could be a lot of questions on this one because it's a messy yeah. one. And I have a lot mm-hmm. of uh, distressed property experience on the mm-hmm. residential side, but it all applies. It's all distress yeah. and distress, right? So, 30 unit was a bad operator. Uh, mm-hmm. I was running it into the ground and uh, we had a couple, a buddy of mine, Brian, who I knew here in Phoenix had gotten to know him and he was doing multifamily stuff and doing well. And he just said to me after we were in a conference, I came out on a, on a while somebody was speaking. It wasn't a break. You know, most of those meetings, the connection stuff happens outside the room. Speakers are good too, yeah, but the big networking is outside the room and at the bar afterwards and all that. So mm-hmm. I was outside of the room and he came out and said, hey, man, you had to jump in this bad Rouge deal with us. I'm like, OK, let's fly down there and check it out. Mm-hmm. And so uh, four person JV, two local boys in Baton Rouge and then me and Brian from Phoenix. Mm-hmm. And um, they crushed it on a 32 unit they had done before. Just mm-hmm. crushed it. So our expectation going in is that Brian and I would just like put 50 grand in mm-hmm. turn the local boys loose. And they would uh, and we'd literally get like three grand a month each net. Mm-hmm. That's what they did on the 32 unit. I mean, wow. crushed. It. And it did not go that way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it didn't didn't roll out that way on number two for mm-hmm. us. 
but we learned a lot and definitely glad we did it. It was, uh, it's been, it was challenging and it was, you know, it was a distress situation and we learned a ton. And yeah. uh, we'll probably be selling that one here pretty soon. We've had a, we had a two year master lease option on it and we were a little past a year into that now or about a year into it. So mm -hmm. we, you know, we'll see. Yeah. Well, yeah, some, some of the distressed ones, those are the ones you learn the most from. So Absolutely. one of them we bought, we bought a 33 unit. This is 2019 and it's for sale right now, but a little bit of a headache is the answer. We bought it at, uh, about 50% occupied and we figured that, oh, it's going to be easy to get this occupied again. We just got to, you know, fix things up a bit. And uh, it wasn't quite as easy as that. Is, let's just, <laughs> right. let's just put it that way. It wasn't quite as easy as that one, but uh you know, three and a half years later, you know, by the time we close, it'll, it'll almost be four years later, but yeah, we'll, we'll end up making money off, but not nearly as much as we thought and for a lot more time than we, we anticipated, but those you know, are not ones to do for, for rookies. You yeah. Know, I mean, somebody in that has the experience, distressed experience, et cetera, yeah. don't do that as your first deal. Yeah. You know, and we, we made tons of mistakes, you know, choosing contractors, you know, the first contractor came in and renovated a bunch of stuff and we had to pay a second contractor to come in and redo everything, you know, and it was just lots and lots and lots of lessons learned there. And you mentioned a couple of them being present when the contractors are there is definitely one of them, but uh, yeah, well, cool. So hopefully, hopefully that turns out well for you guys, even though it was a little more work, but uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it happens. Well, cool. So Question that I love to ask everybody. I love every question that I ask, but uh, I think I say that a lot. What's next for you? You know, we got some land. I, I fund a flipper. I'm from Kansas City originally, and so mm -hmm. I fund a. I do what I call like utility funding. I would say I guess hard money people call it, but it's. Uh, it's I think it was more utility funding for him. He's a high volume flipper, and um, we just got some land together, and so we're going to develop that land in a you know outside of Kansas City, and they need the you know they need the housing. They need it's the highest and best use for the land. So we weren't sure what if we were going to, you know, do storage on it or do whatever, but highest and best use is for housing humans. So that's what we're going to do. Nice. And nice. Among, among other things, you know, I'm getting, I'm a real connector person. So I get invited into a lot of deals. So I never know what's going to happen next. Yeah. We had one uh, fall in our lap last weekend that uh, hopefully works out well for us. But yeah, I, it's nice to the point when you get to the point where people are inviting you in their deals, you know, it's, exactly. it's a lot easier when, you know, 20 people are looking for deals and you're just, uh, yep, I'll take that one or no, nope, you know, right. so, they um, call you up and say, Hey, I've got a problem. Can you help? That's how I got into the 550 in a deal. Yeah. It's my buddy, same buddy, Brian said, Hey, could Kathy's got a problem? Cause I had found some 1031 people mm -hmm. possibly for a Louisiana deal. Mm -hmm. He said, Hey man, you should call Kathy. She has a problem. And so I'm like, okay, how can I help? And that's yeah. how I ended up in that deal. Yeah, somebody, and I don't know who who said this, and I'm going to butcher a quote. But they said, your compensation is directly correlated to how big of a problem you can solve. Yep, that or how many people you help. Or yep. Yep. Yeah, the Zig oh. Ziglar one is the, uh, you can get whatever you want in this life by helping enough other people get what they get want. What, get what they want. If you help enough other people get what they want, you will have more than you'll ever need for your life. Exactly, exactly. So, all right, well, switching gears, Caitlin, how's it going? Hey, thanks for having me on. Doing Absolutely. well? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, do us a favor. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. So I've been in real estate not as long as Todd has. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Definitely a shorter <laughs> tenure so far. I started about six years ago. So when I got into the workforce, I was doing sales. Mm -hmm. I worked for pharmaceutical companies and was doing you know on the road representation in doctor's offices. And it was a great job, but I wasn't fulfilled by it. And I didn't like the corporate feel. So mm -hmm. Started kind of testing the waters for other positions. I yep. found a local real estate company. They were looking for a dispositions manager. So I jumped into that. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of learned the wholesaling business, sold just over 100 deals in about two-year period for them. And mm -hmm. then from there, I launched my own wholesale company, which I actually still run with a business partner. Mm -hmm. Nice. So, yeah. so lots, of, lots of very related experience that should help you a lot in the multifamily game. So now for, for the wholesales, what type of properties were you guys wholesaling? So just primarily single family, local mm -hmm. to us. We do face-to-face -face meetings with the sellers. We're not doing anything remotely. Mm -hmm. And it's mostly, you know, inherited properties that they need a creative solution on how to how to handle them. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So yeah, wholesaling single family. Yeah, you're going through the the whole process and there's a lot of analogies between the single family process and the multifamily process. Just, you know, things get elevated. 
a level. So like I said, I think that experience is going to help you tremendously jumping into multifamily. So question I'd love to ask everybody, and there it goes again. I love questions, <laughs> but uh, what's your why? Why are you doing this? Two parts to that answer. Part, part of it's a business answer, and mm -hmm. it's to get out of the transactional part of wholesaling into something where, you know, you touched on it earlier, you know, more doors under one roof is a little bit simpler, yeah. more streamlined, you can get into bigger opportunities. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of that is my family. I want more time with them. I want the freedom to be able to say, hey, we're going to go on vacation. You know, we have the funds to do it. We have the freedom to do it. And yeah. uh, just providing those opportunities for more time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we, we talked last week, and I think I told you, I took month of November off, you know, and yes, so, <laughs> yes, I remember so, you talking about that. That was great. Yeah, I mean, true truth is, I think I worked five days of November, but, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, took the month of okay. month of November off. And yeah, it gives you you do do definitely have flexibility. And I actually turned a couple of partnership opportunities down, you know, late September, early October, knowing that I had, you know, a lot of stuff going on with the family in November. So it's nice to have that flexibility too. Um, Absolutely. Peyton, Lynn, one, um, one other thing you can do is you can have your, you know, call it whatever you want, your board of directors meeting or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that can be, you know, every six months, one time in Aruba, next time in mm -hmm. Hawaii, next time in that, you know, that's a business yeah. write-off. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. That sounds like a, a great goal to visualize. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Speaking of visualize, have you got this book yet? Vivid Vision? It's great, but uh, Write that one down. yeah, anyway, yeah. that's, that's one on my desk and it, it basically, I mean, long story short, it says, come up with a three-year plan, figure out what your business looks like in three years and write it down. I mean, if I could sum up the entire book in a sentence, that's it, you know, but there, there's a little more to it than that. But anyway, speaking of, we're at the point right now where Caitlin, you get to ask whatever question you want. So we got Todd on the line. What do you want to ask him? Awesome. Um, thank you, Todd, for for allowing us to uh, ask some questions and and pull from your expertise. Mm -hmm. I'm still a little bit in the new phase of getting into multifamily. I have some underwriting experience, but I think the area I'm struggling in the most is finding a team. So, you know, I keep hearing from mentors and different groups that I'm in that it's really a team sport. What would be your best recommendation for finding those people for those roles and those teammates? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's one thing that it's real easy, as you probably know already, on the single family side to be a lone ranger and to, mm -hmm. and to just, oh, I just, it's just going to be easier if I do it myself as opposed to hire somebody or whatever. But the, the my favorite thing about multifamily is it's a team sport. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, you sure you could do it all on your own if you want to do maybe one deal every 10 years, maybe. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it is a full on mm -hmm. team sport. And I think that you just... You know, it's a difficult question to answer on the team stuff, but you have, have you hired people in your wholesaling business? No, it's just myself and my partner. We do everything, you know, really just the two of us. We haven't scaled it. We keep it pretty lean. <laughs> okay, well, don't hire yourself. You're going to interview people or you're going to meet people or whatever. Somebody's going to come to you, maybe wanting to partner and, oh, I like them. Oh, well, maybe that's because they're like you and they're not actually complimentary to you. So mm -hmm. I'm like really geeked up about my, uh, this new partner, Rebecca. Because she and I are like uh, very complimentary, you know, yeah. like it, I, I can go to a conference and talk to lots of people and that gives me energy and a lot of that sucks energy from her. She'd mm -hmm. rather, you know, <laughs> sit in the back room, not talk to anybody. I mean, it's just one thing after the other, like that I suck at, she's good at and vice versa. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, that's now that's, those are strong partners, right? Mm -hmm. So, and you just have to, you know, work on being, always work on being the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. And then you will be attractive to other people, right? Because I was talking to Rebecca just the other day saying, hey, it's cool to be at this stage where these big hitters are coming up to me now and saying, hey, Todd, let's do a deal together. Mm -hmm. These people that have done it longer than me that have, you know, that I learned a lot from, they're like, hey, man, let's, you know, let's get something. Let's do, let's do a deal together. So, and it's more than one person that are starting to do that. So when you start showing up as a better version of yourself, then those around you start expecting you to be like that. And then they can call you out when you're not like that. And then you just keep trying to keep better. And that makes you more of a magnet. It's like, you know, like my teenage son, it's like, you're not going to go like chase down those girls. You're going to become mm -hmm. a better man and they're going to come to you. Yeah. That's, you know, it's a, uh, right. it's a, just a mindset of maybe, you know, how can I making myself the best version I can? Because I get, I get invited into deals. I'm not, Mm -hmm. you know, but you got to go through each step. I know I'm throwing a bunch of stuff from a bunch of directions at you, but 
you yeah. do have to go through all the steps, but that's what I would say. And, and look for complimentary. Don't just team up with someone because you like them because more than likely you're the same kind of person. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I know Brian, you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah. I, I like how you put that. I mean, you're you're basically reversing the narrative. Instead of looking for the perfect partner for me, you know, turn it around and look at yourself and what can I do to be the perfect partner for somebody else? I love that. You know, work on yourself, get yourself better, hone your skills, you know, figure out what hat out of the many hats in this in this team sport that you can wear, you know, or, or which position on the field you can play. And then it's not sequential. I'm, I'm speaking as if it is sequential, but at the same time, put yourself into places where you meet a lot of other people who are doing the same thing. You know, that's why a lot of these conferences, you know, are very popular for new syndicators to go to because they're in a room with, you know, five, 800 people who want to do exactly the same thing as they do. So yeah, work on yourself, you know, become the best version of yourself and you know, figure out which hat you want to wear and then put yourself in a position where you can see other people and be seen by other people. And pay attention to your vibe and your energy when you're doing stuff. Mm-hmm. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean that's what you should be doing. Yeah. You could be you can be good at something, but it might take so much energy and and or you could be kind of halfway, but you might just like love marketing or whatever. And so that's what you should be doing most of the time. Mm-hmm. So pay attention to those things too, that you're really in your wheelhouse. Good yeah, that's great advice, especially with the burnout factor that I've seen a lot of people have. If you're not, if you're good at something, but you're not enjoying it, it's it's not sustainable. And I think sustainability, especially when there's so many deals to look at is important. So that's great you know, advice. I'll yeah. give you a perfect example. I'll go talk to a hundred people. I'll go do 50 conferences. I will do a hundred of these podcasts. And I do not want to go through the, paperwork and all that and Rebecca will read everything Mm -hmm. she will do so there's just just that complimentary for your team it's a beautiful thing Mm -hmm. right yeah I was also um thinking about too you you know you've mentioned a few times that you're in a a really great position now having been in the business for a while that people are bringing you deals Mm -hmm. but when you're getting started getting deal flow is is definitely a challenge I know I've seen it and some of you know my uh, peers have seen that as well is there a recommendation for the most effective way you found in the beginning to find deals? Would that be brokers, wholesalers, any advice? Well, and you know, Brian may have to answer this one too, because mine, um, I'm yeah. a natural connector person, right? And mm-hmm. so I'm genuinely, and it's not some sales class, I'm genuinely interested in meeting people and finding about them. Mm-hmm. So in a building, I'll talk to the janitor, I'll talk to the mid-level manager, I'll talk to the CEO, everybody in between, because I'm just interested in people. The, the first deal I got into, Brian, I get Brian's not on this call, but I guarantee you, Brian would say, you know, I like Todd. He's sharp. He knows what he's doing. I want I wanted him in this deal with me. Mm-hmm. And so that's how I got in my first deal. He said, hey, man, you should be in this Louisiana deal with us. Mm-hmm. But I also have good broker relations and other things. And I've done real estate for a long time. So it's not, it's hard for me. I've been a connector forever mm-hmm. and I've done real estate for a long time. So it's more like breathing to me, like talking to brokers and other stuff. It's just, that's just nothing. Yeah. So maybe I'll defer to Brian. To yeah. To help. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So talking with brokers, here's, here's how I, I like to look at it, you know, and I think that it's a great analogy for single family homes. You know, when you talk with a real estate agent, And you're going to go out and buy your first house. Almost every time the real estate agent is going to ask you if you're pre-approved. Okay. Why are they asking you if you're pre-approved? I mean, the answer is they're vetting you. They want to see, can you actually buy a house and how much house can you buy? All right. Something to realize with commercial brokers, when you first get on the phone with them, they're going to be vetting you every single time. They're going to be asking the same questions in their in their mind. Can you actually buy a multifamily property and how big of a multifamily property can you buy? If you don't pass muster on that first phone call, you've probably lost with that broker. I remember the first broker I called, I I, I told her my sob story, you know, whatever. I you know, I was excited about. It. I thought it was a great story. And there was a listing that she had that I wanted to look at. It was like a a 50 unit apartment complex, a $7 million purchase price. And she kept on pushing me to a 12 unit, $900,000 apartment. 
you know, and she kept on pushing. I didn't realize till later that, and rightfully so, she vetted me and she says, this guy has no business trying to buy a $7 million property. Mm -hmm. Based on what he tells me, he can probably get this $900,000 property. So when you're talking about brokers, once again, I think reverse engineer it, you know, what are the brokers looking for from you? They're looking for somebody who can buy and who is really, really easy to work with. I mean, if you can put a check in both those boxes, you're going to have no problem talking with brokers. Caitlin, I'll give you one too that I thought of while he was talking that um, uh, some people told me is definitely do not, and me being in real estate for a long time, I'm like, oh, I'll just talk to the big dogs or whatever. Now, the experienced brokers they already have, they can make a phone call and probably sell whatever listing they have to 10 or 20 people without ever putting it on the market easily. So you getting in with them, just forget it. Just go with the younger brokers, yeah. Even maybe, you know, not the big houses, maybe even like a Keller Williams commercial mm -hmm. or whatever. Just connect with these younger, more hungry agents that aren't yeah. well-established. The brokers that are well-established, it's not yeah. worth your time. And the well-established brokers, they're not selling the properties that newer syndicators can get to. Exactly. 100%. The well-established brokers, they're selling that 550 portfolio, not that 24. Right. Or they're, they're selling, yeah, they're selling stuff where you're, you know, you're going to have 10 million in your account or don't talk to me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So right. that's also a really good point. And incidentally, I'm, I'm hiring an acquisitions guy. I'm taking him to dinner with one of the junior brokers at one of the brokerages, mm -hmm. you know, and that's going to be, you know, our way into a brand new market is through the junior broker. And also, Caitlin, is you, if you're like, say, good at underwriting, like mm -hmm. like, like the brokers are going to know, don't send me the deal. Send mm -hmm. it to Rebecca. Send it to the person who, and that's who's going to, yeah. you know how to, if they can think, oh, this Caitlin chick, she knows how to underwrite. She knows what's up. She knows why, where this property value, even though my seller wants to sell it at 15 million, she knows it should be like 12 and a half because she knows what she's doing. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to yeah. sell this next one that comes along, I'm going to send to Caitlin. And then when Caitlin calls, I'm going to answer her questions because she knows what she's doing. Yeah, so that, I would say that's, that's definitely more of my superpower. So as I'm looking for teammates, I'm going to look for somebody that's not not great at that because I enjoy the analytical parts of that. I enjoy underwriting the deals. So yeah. hopefully, I can I can get to that point where the where the brokers are coming to me. That would be that'd be fabulous. And do you have a do you have like a mentor or a group that you're affiliated with that you can plug into? I do. Yeah. So I recently joined an online accountability and, and mentoring group, and that's actually been really beneficial. So we have, you know, small teams that we've been broken up into and we're, we're working through a couple of weeks of really just drilling down on one skill set a week. So yeah. <laughs> nice. And then go to uh, some of the more established, but like if you look up ultimate partnering, that's like a can't miss event where the, a lot of the, mm -hmm. the veterans come back for once a year. And that's with Ari Mentor and it's called ultimate partnering. It's in San Diego this year. Oh, nice. The peak uh, peak performance wasn't that what we were at peak right? partnership peak yeah part, peak partnership that had a really good turnout and the guys yeah. that started that were Ari Mentor and they were Ari they were trained yeah. by Ari Mentor a lot of Ari Mentor has been around forever so they've yeah. trained most everybody yeah they, tra um, they trained a lot of the people in the coaching business now right and uh, Michael Blank is another one he's a also big an Ari guy. Mentor guy and he's an Ari Mentor guy but these people that can get you know whatever 800, 1200, 1500 people to come. Those are all that's good energy in the room. Everybody's looking to do deals or they're veterans or whatever. And that's a great place. That's a great energy and people for you to be around. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That's the wonderful thing. I think about commercial and multifamily real estate, you know, bridging over from single family. It really is a good community. There's mm -hmm. I've talked to so many people already that have graciously given me their time that didn't need yeah. to and do genuinely care. So and they usually Excellent. people, a lot of people remember where they came from. Yeah. And like yeah. the, Ari, the Ari mentor kind of ethic is you help each other. It's like a family kind of feel. And so that's time when we all get together, we're always hugging each other and all, you know, everything mm -hmm. because it's like, because everybody lives all over. And so when right. we gather for an event, it's like, yeah. hey, you know, get to see, it's like a family reunion. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we they just had a, an event. I unfortunately didn't make it to the mentorship event that mm -hmm. was live. But, you know, some of my group was was describing it this morning as I think a cartoon coming to life is how one of them put it. You know, just <laughs> seeing people for the first time in person, you know them, yeah. but it, it's a unique feeling. So I'm excited mm -hmm. to hopefully do, you know, at least one event this coming year. Yeah. And, and also people, Brian, me, sponsors, other more experienced people, they're all going to vet you also. Mm -hmm. So, right. you know, once you're, you know, I'm like, what am I, you know, my parents passed in the middle of this thing. So I've got a lot of experience, but still 
So now I'm maybe three years in, mm -hmm. and now the veterans are coming up to me and saying, hey, man, let's do a deal because they've been mm -hmm. able to vet me, been able to watch me. They've been able to watch when traumatic, you know, like tragedy type stuff happens, how I behave. And they, they're like, okay, yeah, this guy's all right. So don't don't get impatient because doing a, a bad deal for your first deal can take you out of the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So make sure your first deal is a good one. All right. Well, we are about out of time. I hate to say that, but we are. Did Caitlin get all her <laughs> questions in? With all yeah. Our she, I mean... <laughs> I would ask I'm questions sure. all day and pick your brain all day, but I appreciate what you were able to share. <laughs> Last question for each of you. Todd, you get to go first. How can listeners learn more about you? Um, I would say, you know, I've got to, the public facing stuff really just needs to be updated. I would say you go to LinkedIn. I'll give you my phone number. Mm -hmm. And then you could go to LinkedIn, but you spell my last name for the listeners. I'm Todd with two Ds. And then Schoengert is S C H O W. E N G E R E T. There are two Todd Schoengerts on LinkedIn. I'm not the truck driver. I'm the real yeah. estate guy. Yeah. And, <laughs> and just like um, it's spelled, I mean, it sound it's spelled just like it sounds. So yeah, a silent C and a silent D. Yeah. Schoengert. And uh, my phone number is 480 228 1441. Again, 480 228 1441. I live in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. All right, Caitlin, same questions for you. How can listeners learn more about you? Sure. I think the place I'm probably most active is on Facebook right now, doing some networking. So, you know, send me a friend request. We can talk there. It's just, you know, my first and last name, Caitlin. My last name is Aquaviva. So A-C-Q-U-A-V-I-V-A. -V -A, and we'll chat. All right. And we'll put links to, to their profiles in the uh, show notes. So you don't have to be able to spell them. You just have to be able to tap a link. So there we go. All right. Well, hey, thanks guys for coming on the show today. Very much appreciate your time. Thank you, Brian. Thank you both. Appreciate it. Hey, if you like that episode, make sure to subscribe. But more importantly, if you haven't joined our multifamily educational community yet, which we call a tribe of Titans, you are missing out. Get 30 days free by clicking the link in the description to this episode or go to thetribeoftitans.info and we'll see you there. Thank <laughs> you.